Now we can welcome our final speaker of the day, Mr. James Rice. Please come to the podium. Thank you all. Uh, I did my first live talk, in-person talk this week, in a beautiful village in Leicestershire. And I think it was a great warm-up act for today. It's a much bigger audience here today. And I'm very pleased to be here to speak to you. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about has come partly out of my uh, thesis PhD research on Tattershall Castle, which is why you're going to see so many photographs of that august building in this presentation. But it is more generally coming out of my work into graffiti studies as well, because there has been something that has been bothering me for a number of years now, that I suspect that graffiti and formal artwork in the medieval period have quite a fluid and dynamic link and I want to try and explore those ideas with you today. So the way that this talk is going to work is I'm going to give you some general background notes really on the links between the sacred and the secular world in that period in time and how I am not completely convinced and others are not completely convinced that they are as separate worlds as we have them in the 21st century. I then want to go into the idea of holy symbols, so symbols which mean something very um, specifically in the medieval period and that could be understood and read, if not by the general populace, then certainly by the elites that are patronising and also consuming this artwork as well. Um, we've already heard a little bit from uh, Linda today about the great debate about VV symbols. And I do want to touch on that and to try and add something to that debate um, from a perspective involving formal artwork. Before, I want to wrap up with a look really at how great towers in the medieval period are actually using apotropaic functions and how this is... It essentially wrapped up with notions of lordship and mastery. So the first point I really want to make to you, again, is, is backing up that statement about the idea of the sacred and the secular. And there's a few choice quotes here pulled from a, a Kent Rawlinson article on chapels and great houses. And what Kent is essentially getting at here is that there is a really deeply close connection in the medieval mind between the religious and the temporal, that they aren't pulling those two ideas apart, that there's a, a really important link. So we are seeing lords as the patrons of castles and great houses, but also of great religious institutions. Now, that should come as no shock to anybody who knows really even the smallest bit about medieval uh, uh, life and medieval patronage and medieval buildings. But what we're seeing here is some notes on the fact that religion is being imported and religious thinking is being imported into the secular buildings as well as inhabiting churches such as the one we stand in now. And some of the ways that this actually happens are quite subtle. So here's Tattershall, for example, and a quote from uh, Matthew Johnson, who wrote a really influential book, came out in 2002, called Behind the Castle Gate, which really explores the conceptual nature of castles. And one of the things he points out is that the way that you approach a castle is very processional, and it's very ordered, and there are certain routines and rituals, even imbued within getting through the gate and then once you're through that outer gate can you then get through the next gate and the next gate then you have to negotiate the labyrinth of corridors before finally you come to the lord's great tower the symbol of his mastery over the landscape and over lives as well and you can see an element of this here at Tattershall that the great tower which you see on the right hand side is dominating the entire landscape you can see it for 17 20 miles around it really does stand out but as you get closer and closer up that road from the aquatic links in the landscape um, from Tattershall Bridge coming up from the river, river with them you'll see you see this show front first uh, which is telling you that this is a really significant member of society. It's built for a Lord Treasurer. And then we see you coming in off that road after having seen the view of the castle here. Um, through the gate, you get another view of another elevation of the castle. Then if you're 
essentially posh enough you're allowed to go into the middle ward you get another view of the corner here then you come round and you see this tower fronted by other structures as well which you have to go through so it's going to be redolent of a liturgical procession in the minds of people who are so used to seeing them and then once you get into that tower you're going up the staircase it gets more magnificent as you go up and then off the staircase, down this wonderful processional corridor, there's an anteroom to um, create more theatre and ceremony. And then you're brought into the Lord's great chamber. And then if you're important enough, you can then be brought in to a privy chamber down here. So it's this idea of the processional access to a castle, which may be redolent of the sacred in the secular world. And then even the details are there as well. And it shouldn't take too much to explain to you that this is a castle door, but it is very similar to what's next door in the church, which is also patronised by Ralph Lord Cromwell, the Lord Treasurer as well. This design of the flat-topped arch with the decorative spandrels, the Gothic arch with the fancy mouldings, can be found in churches, it's found in castles, and at a lower social scale, it can be found in vernacular architecture because everyone wants to keep up with the Joneses. So we see this type of, in a sense, ecclesiastical door, which, of course, many of these doors are being built by the same masons uh, who have trained on both sacred and secular um, buildings but here we see it rendered in timber next to a run of what are to all intents and purposes traceried windows so you import that religiosity into your secular world and then to try and bring this down to the level of graffiti studies which we've covered in so many angles during this conference today here is another way which we can see the kind of the slide from the formal to the informal so we have these burn marks, which we haven't really covered in any great detail in any of the papers today, and I'm going to, going to briefly, sketchily cover it now. But there's been good proof, really, by John Dean and Nick Hill in vernacular architecture that these are deliberate behaviours. Lots of other people have written how they have relationships to ritual protection, to inoculation, to protection from lightning and connections to evil spirits and witches and the like but it's worth considering how these marks and when these marks may have actually been made so if we think about candlemas and twelfth night rituals in churches where candles are gathered together and blessed on mass and then doled out to the parishioners with the specific intention that the candle will give you power over the devil. It's then not a big stretch to imagine the candle being taken back home, as we saw in Janine's paper, and stuffed in a wall, or being used to actually burn the building a little bit, to bring some of that religious power back home, to protect from the devil, from witches, from evil spirits, etc., and so then we must start thinking, if this is the case with burn marks, can we actually backtrack the apotropaic graffiti, which we're finding in so many of our buildings, and can we see that in formal church or elite architecture as well? And the remainder of the paper, I'd like to try and prove to you that we can follow these symbols up to elite society. So the pentagram, for example, this has quite a well understood uh, historiography, ultimately. We see it there in literature, the famous Gawain poem, and I do recommend to you the new film, The Green Knight, which has recently come out dealing with this poem, dated to more or less the same period of time as this church in the later 14th century, and also written in a North Staffordshire Cheshire dialect, too, so highly resonant of where we're all stood. This contains an absolutely in-detail breakdown of the purpose of the pentagram. It's Christian numerology. It's lots of fives, repeated fives. Um, Chris has already told us a little bit about the five wounds of Christ in his paper. And here we're seeing that the pentagram is connected to that idea so the more ideas of five that you put together the more powerful the symbol and of course we know from the poem um, that it's there as a representation of the symbol of Solomon which um, is uh, held on a seal ring and it's given by um, God to Solomon of the Bible to protect him from evil spirits so this is 
you can't really get an, a clearer medieval iteration of what a symbol means. So here it is in formal literature, and here it is in architecture as well. We can trace that pentagram symbol through the buildings. It's there on the market church at Hanover, on the tower here. Of course, towers are important. They're symbols of lordship. Um, and also here, slightly more subtly, we see it on the West Front, the famous decorated West Front of Exeter, also linked to lots of other Christian numerology. There's twelves and threes in there, uh, fives and sevens too. So lots of numerology included in that great window. But we're able to follow through the literature and the architecture, and then I think we can see it in the graffiti as well. And I think there's a dynamic link between those um, aspects. Another holy symbol that we might want to consider, therefore, that we touched upon again in other papers, in particular in Linda's, is this idea of the daisy wheel, the hex foil, the rosette, the compass drawn circle, whatever we want to call it. Um, it is there in graffiti. There is a good precedent for the use of this in formal geometrical proportions used by both carpenters and stonemasons so we can find it in the design of roof structures and here you can see how by by linking certain points of a six petal rosette we can create simple but very effective shapes which then go on to form architectural features such as the equilateral headed door at Wingfield, such as the space of the Great Hall at Knoll, and such as this beautiful font at Bottisford, created out of these wonderful symbols. Are we seeing sacred geometry in play here? Does this explain to us why these rosettes are so important across society? And certainly there's a very formal use of these rosettes at the earlier period. Um, so Tony Hack has been taking wonderful photographs of these essential daisy wheel tympana in the marcher lands, for example. I think Brentwardine is one of the best ones. I've, I've used one from Nottinghamshire, where we're seeing the daisy wheel as a stand-in or an accompaniment to the cross. So we get some iterations, such as Hawksworth here, where the daisy wheel is found in close association with a cross over a doorway. Of course, it's a liminal portal into the building. We've spoken so much about portals to, uh, to, uh, today. Um, and so in other places, the cross is removed and we only have the daisy wheel, which indicates to us that there is a strong power to this symbol. It's a stand-in for the cross. And it survives really beyond the 11th and 12th centuries. It survives into the 14th century with an iteration here at, uh, at Norwich, for example. And it's not just in architecture. This is clearly a symbol which is seen as being imbued with power. And these endless line designs, such as the pentagram or these uh, daisy wheel designs, are clearly attractive. And if you're a soldier, you want as much protection as possible. Yes, Gawain puts on his armour, but then he daubs himself in pentagrams because he's afraid of the Green Knight. Here we see martial representations which incorporate the daisy wheel. So we see on, the, uh, on, on the, um, uh, th this knight's armour here, daisy wheels, we see it on this helmet here. Even on the tomb brass of Ralph Lord Cromwell's um, um, memorial, we see the daisy wheel incorporated. And of course, there is the Lord, the patron of Tattershall Castle, in his armour. Um, so this is spiritual protection uh, on top of physical protection. And it's there on furniture. We can find it in all sorts of different locales. Here, juxtaposed with uh, tracery um, designs, again, redolent of s sacred architecture, um, uh, even with another endless line design here, the two together at Haddon. And it's just worth noting that we can actually sometimes see the formal art maybe giving rise to the informal graffiti. So I know the slides on the left are slightly unclear, but here we have a late example of rosette designs on a coffer. And on this band here, we do actually have lots and lots and lots of circular and daisy wheel designs, as if the formal artwork is giving license for the informal graffiti. And there it is again in the form of ampullae. We had a paper at Salisbury at Hidden Charms 2 on ampullae. We'll come back to this illustration in just one moment. 
Um, and there may even be a continuity. Um, uh, Brian's written a lot about witch bottles and the use of um, Bartman jugs. I do wonder if some of these are being imported from the Low Countries and Germany specifically for the market to put sharp things and we in them uh, to protect against witches. And of course, they do come with a rosette design. Is that deliberate as well? Are we seeing these reacting to that quite old tradition that's there? in formal art. So we come now to the great debate before finishing up with a note on towers. Um, I fall very much in the middle ground here. Um, I certainly don't follow the principle that all of these things, uh, the V's and M's in graffiti, are apotropaic. I think that quite a lot of them are initials. But I would like to add these few notes to the debate. Firstly, I don't think we can get away from the fact that M's and also A's and R's are very important in medieval iconography. I would encourage you all to look up right now. You're looking at a 14th century ceiling there, which is full of the symbols that I've just been talking about and will continue to talk about. There is the classic examples of these informal mainstream Christian art. Uh, we can't get away from the fact that some of these symbols definitely do have Marian iconography connected to them. Um, and that their spatial relationships can be read. So here we see the west front of um, Fakenham Church in Norfolk. Um, there is a crowned M for Maria. There is a crowned D for Dominus, Lord, i.e. Christ. And there is the VV. It's also got a crown on it. The only thing, letters that we're seeing here have all got crowns on. They are connected to heavenly bodies, to heavenly people. So if that isn't connected in some way to the Marian cult or to um, uh, uh, the, 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 the occupants of heaven, if you like, we have to explain what it is. It can't be an initial in this case. It's not just some local patron of architecture. And the VVs do occur in lots of contexts in formal Christian art. We see it here in blind tracery, on a pulpit, on a bench end, and again, as we've just seen previously, on an ampulle in connection with a rosette as well. This is a powerful symbol. Now, not all VVs are connected to the Marian cult, but I do think we have to look at the Christian mainstream art and understand that there is a link for many of these designs. So I just want to finish off then by thinking again about these great towers and how the secular world intersects with the sacred. So this is a great tower, a symbol of lordship, the architectural focus of Bookton Palace in Cambridgeshire. Now, yes, this is a domestic residence, but it is the domestic residence of the Bishop of Lincoln. It's a very impressive site. Uh, you can actually stay in rooms here for a very reasonable price. Um, it's a very well-preserved site. You'll, you'll notice that there's a close connection with the parish church as well, so that interlinking of, of sacred and secular mixed up with, of course, the, the bishopric. And in the diaper work pattern, as we've just seen in Mark's talk, we can see important um, symbols being picked out. Now, it shouldn't come as a great shock to find that we've got a cross in connection with the Bishop of Lincoln. But other patrons are using diaper work to pick out symbols which are familiar to us from graffiti studies. Now, Bookton is essentially a carbon copy made in the 1480s, 1490s, that period, of the earlier Great Tower at Tattershall. The two share the same DNA. Tattershall comes first by about 40 or 50 years. And here... Through intensive survey on the Great Tower, I was able to spot a VV and an M in close connection with each other. Now, I think we're seeing here that idea of Marian symbology and, um, on the Great Tower. So why might a great lord have wanted to show close connection to the Marian cult? Well, firstly, um, we're looking at religion as power here. Um, we're looking at the use of religion to show your piety which meant that you were a great lord the two are so interlinked and here we can kind of see the idea of lordship and religion together so on one of the other faces on the principal show front of the castle we see yes there's another m 
and up here we see a shield the symbol of lordship so we've got the two together in close association and it's worth just sort of picking up on mick aston's point that boundaries of place did not separate religious and secular images so it's perfectly normal to do this and therefore when we look at fakenham in a bit more detail we've already seen the d's the m's and the vv's and also all of the shields here so we are again seeing that close connection between sacred and secular in what is all to all intents and purposes a sacred building and a secular building but in both classes of building we are seeing those close connections and seeing symbols which are familiar to us from graffiti studies so really to conclude the conference today and conclude my paper i'd just like to sort of say that there isn't a delineation between sacred and secular to the medieval mind um, and sacred thinking is there in people's thoughts whether or not they are elite or non-elite and that's probably why we're finding it in graffiti studies as well as formal art um, when we do find it in formal art it's there as an expression of the patron whatever that actually means sometimes it might be great piety sometimes it might be just using piety to prove lordship um, and we can probably see these deliberately implanted symbols um, which can be found in graffiti and I wonder about that relationship though and that's my question to you it's the same question I asked when I gave another iteration of this paper two years ago at the making your mark symposium is it a dynamic and fluid relationship uh, who is doing the graffiti possibly in certain contexts we might even be seeing great lords involved in making their mark on the buildings as well thank you very much Brian back over to you sir